Okay, welcome to our second webinar for International Education Week, co-sponsored by the Duke UNC Area Studies Centers and the North Carolina Department for Public Instruction. My name is Kevin Fogg. I'm the Associate Director at the Carolina Asia Center here on the center on the campus of UNC Chapel Hill. And I'm so delighted that this evening we're going to hear from Michelle Drumgold's sermon about displacement in the Middle East, causes, consequences, and communities in diaspora. Tonight's webinar is sponsored by the UNC Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies. Just a couple of reminders as we get started here about Zoom etiquette. It's best to mute ourselves during the presentation so that we can hear what the speaker is saying and don't get a lot of ambient noise. To do that, you should see a mute button usually at the bottom of your screen, perhaps at the top of your screen if you're using a tablet. Um, to improve connectivity for everyone, we encourage you to keep your video off during the presentation and then turn your video on when we have interactive moments. You can use that using the start video button either at the bottom of your screen on a laptop or the top of your screen if you're on a tablet or a phone. And then you can ask your questions using the chat box and feel free to toss those in at any time. We'll have a couple of moments to step back for a question and answer. Uh, for the webinars that we're running this week, a certificate of completion for continuing education units will be distributed by the North Carolina Department for Public Instruction by January 31st, 2023. We ask that all participants stick around to complete a survey that we'll have at the end of this session. Those of you who are watching asynchronously, um, you'll see that survey link at the end of the recording. And we need to record your time uh, after watching the whole thing for you to get the one and a half hours for this. We will send out presentation slides to everyone who participates live, who participates synchronously on the 15th, excuse me, 14th of November. Um, if you're hoping to get a copy of presentation slides uh, after an asynchronous viewing, you can send um, um, email to the contacts at the end of the presentation and we'll get that out to you by email. Um, let me now welcome a message from our partners at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Good evening, educators. My name is Christy Day, and I serve as the Director of Academic Standards at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. On behalf of the Global Education Steering Committee at DPI, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the International Education Week webinar series, Resilience in the Face of Conflict. International Education Week is an opportunity to celebrate the benefits of education and exchange worldwide. This joint initiative of the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of State is part of the effort to promote programs that prepare Americans for a global environment and attract future leaders from abroad to study, learn, and exchange experiences. International Education Week offers the chance to expand awareness of and interest in global issues and global learning, collaborate with and learn from international student groups, gain a new cultural understanding and sample a small part of life beyond the shores of America. This is our fourth year celebrating International Education Week at DPI, as well as our fourth year partnering with the UNC Duke Area Studies Centers to provide a professional learning series on global education. We are so grateful to have these collaborative partners who seek to ensure that educators in North Carolina are globally engaged, aware, competent, and responsive. This year's week-long International Education Week Professional Development Webinar Series, Resilience in the Face of Conflict, aims to address themes around the concepts of home, resilience, resistance, war, and change. In addition to the webinar series, a variety of activities are in the works at DPI to promote and celebrate International Education Week in North Carolina. A pre-recorded webinar, a day of celebration, has been posted and shared to highlight global education efforts across the state. A virtual student showcase offers students an opportunity to share their interest and understanding of global issues, global learning, and cultural awareness through various projects, presentations, or work samples. We are grateful for the work you are doing as educators who value the importance of global education and humanity. Thank you for your commitment to North Carolina students and their continued journey of global learning. Enjoy tonight's session. As Dr. Day said, we've got an opportunity for continuing education unit hours. Um, for each hour that, uh, for each webinar that you participate in this week, um, you can get 1.5 hours, and those are also available for uh, asynchronous uh, viewers. 
In addition, there are options for getting up to 4.5 more hours um, by performing one of the activities listed in these slides. And again, I'm happy to email this out to all participants after the seminar. So option one is a flip grid recording and activity. And you'll see the instructions here. I'm talking about what did you find valuable as a global educator from this series? What's an activity or assignment that you plan to use with your students? And how will this activity foster global students, excuse me, students' global awareness? And you'll get the full details of this via email. Option two is about a recorded interview. So you can find someone in your community, a student, a colleague, a member of the Area Studies Committee, a person from another country, and talk to them about what this week's theme, resilience in the face of conflict, means to them. You should ask at least three different questions, and you can develop questions to consider some of the big themes for this week. Why should we learn about other cultures? Why is that important? Why is it important to be aware of how people experience resilience? And if you're interviewing a student, you might ask about an assignment that you've had them do or how their studies are improving their awareness. The third option is to create a collage. And you can see some instructions here, pulling together at least six different pictures and trying to capture some of the aha moments from our webinars this week. If you have questions about these opportunities to earn extra continuing education unit hours, you can contact our partners at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, Felicia Sanders and Michelle McLaughlin, and you see their emails on the screen now. Tonight's webinar is sponsored by the Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies here at UNC Chapel Hill, which promotes understanding of the Middle East through teaching, research, and community outreach. It's distinguished by a cross-regional approach to Middle East studies, one that breaks down area studies barriers in order to track global flows of ideas, commodities, and people. And that's certainly a big part of our webinar this evening. The Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies at UNC is part of the North Carolina Consortium for Middle East Studies, a collaboration between Duke, UNC, and other universities in North Carolina, sponsoring things like the Arabic Teacher Council and professional development opportunities for teachers to learn more about the Middle East. This evening, our speaker is Michelle Dromgold Sermon. She's a PhD candidate in sociology here at UNC Chapel Hill. She works on US immigration law and policy, legality and migrant belonging, global migration governance, and Middle East displacement and diaspora. For this, she spent a lot of time researching and working in Germany, Turkey, you might know this as Turkey, and here in the United States. So let me now hand it over to Michelle to talk about displacement in the Middle East, causes, consequences, and communities in diaspora. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you all of us who are here, all, all of you who are here um, with us in person, and those of you who will be viewing later online as well. Um, so to sort of you know, start our conversation about displacement in the Middle East, I wanted to start out with a map. Um, the Middle East is often defined in lots of different ways. Um, and for the purposes of our discussion this evening about displacement in particular, you'll see that I've drawn a very broad geographical definition of the Middle East with these countries in the Carolina blue. Um, and so you'll see here, right, that I've included countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan, and also included North Africa in our conversation. Um, and part of the reason I do that is because what we find in studying displacement is that the movement of people isn't defined by the region's borders or the country borders that we have created as people. And so I think that drawing sort of a broader geographical boundary is important to show how people move across geographies as well. So Kevin, if you want to go ahead. So we're going to start off our evening together with some trivia. Um, so I'll go ahead and put this in the poll for those of you who are on, on Zoom with us right now. Um, and those of you who are on participating later, you'll be able to view them on the PowerPoint as well. You know, even I, as your moderator tonight, don't know a lot of these answers for true and false. I wish I could take this quiz with you. Well, and that's okay. That's part of part of the purpose of uh, of the trivia. Is I think it it starts discussion and conversation. 
So I'll give a few more seconds for, for participants to submit their responses. All right, and then Kevin, if you wanna go ahead on to the next slide. One more, there'll be a graph. All right, so the first question, right? More than 89 million people worldwide are currently displaced from their homes. That is true. Um, I think it was also included in the advertisement and some other um, news, right? So, so good job, everyone got that correct. Um, and here is a map of, right, our graph short, sort of showing the growth or the rise of displaced people over time. And so you'll see that the number of forcibly displaced people is higher now than it has been in the last 20 years. Um, and so, right, that I think is an important reason to also talk about displacement um, because it's at an all time high. And just clicking to the next slide, we'll see the, the second question um, is the second question was, hold on, was that most of the people who are forcibly displaced live in another country. And this is actually false. Um, so 59.5% of the people who are forcibly displaced, forcibly displaced are actually in what we call internally displaced. And I'll go over the definitions of these sorts of migrant terms in just a minute. Um, but so that means that they've never actually crossed national borders. The next question um, about four out of every 10 refugees live in countries neighboring their country of origin. Um, this in the way it's written is in some cases true, right? Four out of 10 do live, but in, in fact, it's actually seven out of 10 uh, refugees are living in a neighboring country. The fourth question, Turkey or Turkey, um, they've recently changed their name in all their official United Nations documentation. And so that's why I'm using their, their new name, the Turkish name. Um, they host more refugees than any other country, right? 3.8 million refugees. And the final question about refugees and asylees are granted rights equal to citizens. This is false, right? So each country determines the legal, social, and employment rights that are granted to refugees and asylees. And even if they can obtain equal rights, the, the protections they receive often aren't immediate, right? So there's often a period where they're not being guaranteed rights that are equal to others. So to sort of contextualize this, a lot of what I'll be talking about today is contemporary displacement, right? But I think it's important to have a historical context for this as well, right? So what we sort of see in a historical conversation about displacement is that the Holocaust and the genocide of minority groups in Europe during World War II were really key in promoting and prompting the formation of the United Nations, the creation of a new global discourse on human rights, and the emergence of this new label of refugees, which is um, sort of indoctrinated in the 1951 Geneva Convention. And I've included here a link, um, which I can also send in the chat, that is a really interesting resource um, about, that shows sort of how refugee flows have changed over time. Um, and I think it would be a great resource to use in a classroom. Um, and so I've, I've used it in a classroom when I've done this talk as well. So now we can turn over to the definitions. So there are five definitions I want to give. Um, and I've given you all of the text here mostly so that you have it as a resource. Um, and because it's important context for thinking about a graph that I'd like to show you. So Oftentimes we think about refugees in the United States context as people who have been resettled, right? People who are coming to the United States through a refugee resettlement program. And we might be familiar with refugee resettlement organizations working in our state or in our local communities. So when the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, who is the organization that is sort of entrusted with caring for refugees around the globe, when they talk about a refugee, this is the specific definition that they are referring to that, ref that comes from the 1951 Geneva Convention, right? And so they really want to make sure that there's a well-founded fear of persecution. Um, and right again, refugees are people who have left their country of origin. Asylum seekers, again, right, thinking in a US context are often people who we think of who are coming into the United States and then are asking for protections. They're asking for legal protections here. Um, and so the, the definitions sound very similar. Um, and I think the main 
way of differentiating sort of in general um, is to think about oftentimes we think about refugees in sort of a group definition, right? Syrians are refugees or Ukrainians are refugees, whereas asylees are, are case by case basis. So we might see, you know, what is the case of one person coming to Germany or to the United States um, from abroad and what was their particular um, situation in another country. Then there are some definitions that you might be less familiar with. Um, so the first is this idea of internally displaced persons, right? So these are people who have been, they've forced to leave, they've been forced to leave their home or flee, but they haven't actually crossed a border. And right, again, this is actually a majority of the people who we're talking about when we talk about displacement. Um, and so you can think about the particular difficulties that internally displaced people might face because they might still be in a country of conflict um, and they might not actually be able to access resources um, that people who are refugees and are crossing those borders are able to access. Another group, which is a much smaller percentage of people um, are considered stateless. And so this um, is, is sort of a, a, a legal phenomenon in many cases. Um, so the, this is a case where um, we, we often get our nationality from our parents, right? Or from being born in a country as in the United States. But in some countries, the way that the laws are written, they don't allow a mother oftentimes to pass their nationality to their children. And so this means that if a Lebanese woman, for example, is married to a foreign man, that she is unable to pass her citizenship to her, to her Lebanese child. Um, and so in this case, if the child cannot get citizenship from their father, then they become stateless. And so this is a group that is of, of particular concern to the United Nations as well. And the final group that you'll see in the, the following slide as well um, is the UNRWA refugees. So this stands for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. And this was created following the 1949 Arab-Israeli conflict and pertains only to Palestinians, right? And so when the UNHCR talks about refugees, they don't actually include Palestinians in that, def in that sort of group or in the statistics. And so particularly in thinking about the Middle East, I think it's sort of a, an, an important thing to note um, as well. So the reason I go through all of these definitions is because it's important if you'd ever like to access any of this data, but it's also important to understand sort of how the UNHCR is breaking down displacement, right? So you'll see from this graph sort of how much internally displaced people or IDPs are really making up a majority of what we think about as displacement. The, the darker blue right is refugees, Right, so again, a pretty large group um, that has gotten bigger over time. And you'll see, right, the, the number of Palestinians hasn't really changed over time, right? There's been no real solution presented to Palestinian refugees. Um, another interesting or important thing to think about with Palestinian refugees is that they are also often disadvantaged when they are doubly displaced. So for example, Palestinians who maybe left Palestine in 19, 40, 49, and are still in Syria, but then are displaced from Syria, aren't actually considered refugees from Syria because they're not Syrians, they're Palestinians. Um, and so particularly in thinking about displacement in the Middle East, it's an important group to think about as well. So I have a few more maps I'd like to show. Um, so this is all gathered from data issued by the UNHCR that's very easy to access. Um, so I encourage you, if you're interested in, you know, looking for data or data exercises with your students, this would be a great resource to turn to. So you'll see here I've created a map that looks at where people are coming from and labeled some of the big ones, right? So Syria um, is, right, probably evident to most of us, as well as Afghanistan, right, are big countries of origin of refugees or here, not refugees, forcibly displaced people. Um, Iraq, Palestine, Yemen, and Sudan also are, are pretty high as well. And then if you can click over to the next map, Kevin, right? So again, you'll see some similar countries here, right? All of those that were major countries of origin 
are also major countries of displacement. And there we really see visually the, the result of internally displaced people, right? That most Syrians haven't left Syria, they're still there. Same thing in Afghanistan. Um, and then what we also see, which we talked about in our trivia activity, is that right? neighboring countries are really the ones who are hosting the majority of, ref of, of displaced people. So we see Pakistan right, becoming a, a shade lighter of blue, Turkey being quite light as well. Um, Jordan, again, um, and Lebanon right, isn't really visible on the map, but is there as well, right? a big host of Syrian refugees in particular. So um, right, this is sort of in the overview of global displacement, Middle East displacement. So I'd like you to take just a, a minute and think about how might you make information on global and Middle Eastern displacement accessible to your students. And also feel free to share any questions in the chat that you have so far, or to share them as they come up uh, moving forward in, the, in our webinar this evening. All right, so hopefully you've had a little bit of time to, to think about what, what you might do or how you might implement this, right? One idea that's been shared is to think about, um, right, doing comparisons between different forms of displacement. And we'll talk a little bit about a sort of a similar activity that might sort of guide or connect some of those ideas as well. Um, and I think, right, yeah, some of the ideas about statistics could be useful as well. Yeah, I'm glad that some of the graphs have been useful as well. I hope that those would be some, some good resources as well. Um, I like to try to include as many visuals as possible because I think a lot of these abstract concepts really are best captured through, through visuals. So we're gonna now step into the, the next section of our, of our evening, which is thinking about some of the causes of displacement in the Middle East. And so while we have the chat open, if those of you who are here with us online, um, we can just do some brainstorming together. So what are some causes of displacement in the Middle East that might come to mind? Yeah, so conflict in Yemen, something that's been ongoing. Yep, there's been some persecution in Iran and um, protests as well. So we can talk about some of these um, as well as right, some other, other um, sort of categories, right? What, what is the cause of displacement in the Middle East? So I've put together sort of a list trying to think of some of the main, the main things going on in the Middle East, um, sort of in contemporary and a little bit of historical context as well. Um, and so the first I think that's pretty important is thinking about constructions of ethnic and national belonging. Um, 
right? And this is often a cause of conflict. Um, and right, well, I'm not focusing particularly on Middle Eastern history. Um, if you look at the, the map of the Middle East or even of Africa, right, you'll see that most of the borders are straight lines, right? Are cutting through, you know, different areas that maybe were just, you know, united villages before the before the end of the colonial period in the Middle East. And so one example that I think, you know, really points out the way that ethnic and national belonging can lead to displacement is the example of Turkey. Um, and so if we think about the formation of Turkey, it was marked by genocide in Armenia, sort of in, in 1915, 1917, right? That meant that there was a very, a very stark distinction between ethnicity and nationality. There was also a really big migration and population exchange between Bulgaria and Turkey and Greece and Turkey, right? So a lot of people who were ethnically Greek and lived in Turkey were moved back to Greece and Turks who were living in Greece moved back to Turkey. Um, and this still has consequences now. Um, so for example, there are still a number of Turks who live in Bulgaria, but speak Turkish, some of whom I've met in Germany, right? And then I speak Turkish with them. Right? So it's quite surprising. Um, but there's, there's very much a mix, right? But the way that nation states were formed, um, right, sort of indoctrinated people into, into understanding what a nation was and what language should be spoken. Sort of the longer term consequence of this is that into the contemporary period, we see a suppression of non-Turkish languages. And so the biggest um, minority group in Turkey is the Kurds. And so there are you know, people who are now in their 50s or 60s who were unable to learn any Kurdish or speak any Kurdish because it was not allowed by national policies. And that means that in many cases, the language has been lost um, for that generation. And we still see this right today in the form of ethnic tensions and also in terms of foreign policy, right? There's a lot of tension between Armenia and Turkey. Um, and there's also very large ethnic tensions between sort of Turks and, and Kurds as well. Um, and we also see a lot of tensions between Turks and Arabs. And so I think that has shaped a lot of the reception that Syrians in particular have received in Turkey as well, sort of in a contemporary context. Um, we also, right, we can think about, there's a lot of war happening in the Middle East, um, right? We can think of Iraq and Syria, and we can also think about war in broader terms in incorporating sort of failed states as well, right? So Afghanistan, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Yemen are all cases, right, where we see, we see contemporary war going on. Revolution has also been happening, right? If we think about the Arab Spring happening in recent years, um, in particular, Egypt and Algeria. And then we can also think about sort of the geography of the Middle East. There's strained resources when we think about climate change. Um, there's not a lot of water in the region and that has impacts for agriculture. Most countries don't have a very robust agricultural sector. Um, Turkey is perhaps one exception that could actually grow most of its own food, um, but other countries import a lot of their food. And so that means if there's not enough water, they can grow less food. Um, and if there's not water, that's gonna exacerbate some of these conflicts that we've talked about, right? So you can really think about how all of these things are interconnected. So just thinking about, oh, there's war in Syria is just touching the surface, um, but they're really, really interconnected. Another example we can think of is environmental factors, right? Sort of related to this idea of climate change and strained resources. We saw flooding in Pakistan just a few months ago. And one of the things that's particularly difficult is when I spoke about the different types of displaced people, right? Refugees, asylum seekers. So refugees, we didn't see anything about environment or climate change in that definition. And so that means that people who are impacted by environmental factors or climate change aren't guaranteed the same protections as people who are you know, displaced because of war or persecution. And so I think that's one of the main things that scholars and people at the UN are continuing to talk about. What will the future of displacement look like when we don't have the necessary protections to sort of respond to the environmental migration that we're going to be seeing more of in the next 
10, 20, 30 years. So to sort of think about this a little bit more, I've put together an activity that I've used in the past with my own students, right, at the undergraduate level. And I'll share the link here with you in the chat. So we're going to, to talk about an activity that's thinking about the sort of the binary between forced migration and, um, and displacement, right? So how do we think about this idea? Um, and one of the things I noticed in putting this together is that it's also something that is, is a standard sort of talked about in, in North Carolina schools as well, right? Sort of thinking about the impact that, you know, forced migrants and economic migrants have. Uh, and one of the things that scholars are talking a lot about is how we complicate this, right? So it's not always so easy to tell who is a forced migrant and who is an economic migrant. And so the activity I've put together, which we'll also do together now, works to complicate that. So I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and go into breakout groups. Um, and I'll give everyone about, let's say seven minutes, right? You can go ahead and, and introduce yourself and make sure you've gotten the activity downloaded um, and work through as many of the questions as you can, right? So you'll see there's different sort of case studies. You don't have to go in order. You can pick whatever's most interesting to you, but sort of in pairs, right? To think about where would I put this person on a continuum, right? Where, how would they all sort of line up and who would, who would we want to give those UNHCR protections to, right? Who are we going to sort of prioritize over other people? All right, so hopefully that will be a helpful activity for those of you who are viewing online um, to think about how you might implement in the classroom. Um, as I've noted in the activity itself, right, I encourage you to, you know, have students meet in pairs. We were discussing, um, you could even have it sort of a, be an extended activity where students might, you know, make an initial response and then different groups of students might research a particular case or a particular country scenario and then come back to see, right, how people have shifted on the continuum. Um, and so if you wanna go ahead and click to the next slide, Kevin, I think we've already sort of done this reflection in our breakout group, um, but I encourage those of you who are online to think a little bit about how you might adapt this exercise for your students, um, right? How would it best be adapted to your classroom setting? Um, and what would be some of the benefits of, of implementing it or incorporating it with your curriculum as well? You know, Michelle, I thought of another idea of what you really could do, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, okay. you could even have students speak from first person as that person and argue mm -hmm. their perspective and why they should be allowed um, to migrate and, and move. Um, and that way they kind of make it more personable. That's a, a great suggestion um, and actually would fit in with some other sort of concepts that are actually what refugees and asylum seekers go through, right? So when you are displaced to another country or when you seek asylum in a country, oftentimes what you're really doing is justifying to your the administrator, right? To the immigration official, why you're worthy of protection. Right, and backing it up with evidence, with videos of your persecution, with direct threats you might have received, right? That you as an asylum seeker really need asylum in the United States or in Germany, or that you really need to be resettled as a refugee, right? And so it might seem sort of strange to think about it in that way, but I think sort of that, you know, first person account would actually really well emulate, really closely emulate what a lot of refugees and asylum seekers feel like they have to do to get the protection that they need. So that's a great idea. So we're now gonna jump into sort of the next section of our talk to think about a little bit of some of the consequences of displacement, right? So we've sort of overviewed what's happening, what are the numbers like, why are people being forced to move, but what are the consequences of displacement, right? And we can think about this at a number of levels, right? What are some personal consequences that people might face? 
what are some consequences for the countries they're going to? What are the consequences for the countries they're leaving? Um, so go ahead and take a minute and share in the chat anything that comes to mind. What are some of the consequences of displacement in the Middle East that we might think about? Yeah, so I'll share some of these as they come in, right? So we can think about loss of community, right? The loss of the, the people you rely on in your neighborhood, loss of, loss of losing touch with your family, um, close family in some cases. You can also think about losses of resources, financial, professional stability. Um, a lot of people I've talked with, right? You, you try to take as much of your wealth with you, right? If you own gold, which is common in the Middle East, right? You bring all of your gold with you. Um, but a lot of the other wealth that we have, we can't necessarily bring with us, especially when you're, you know, given 10 minutes to pack and, and leave. Um, and we can also think about, yeah, we lose culture, language, right? There's a lot that we take for granted that we don't really think about um, until you would, if someone is forced to leave where they live. And safety, safety is a big one, um, safety and security. And so what I've actually found in my research with refugees in the United States is that, that that key of feeling safe is really important for refugees to feel like they belong in their community. And so that's a, a big one as well. So Kevin, if you wanna go ahead and click over to the next slide. Um, right, so right, again, returning to our trivia, Right, 72% of refugees live in countries neighboring their country of origin, right? And so we can think about some of the consequences that that's going to have for the countries they're going to as well. So I have, I have a map here as well, um, sort of think about this to look at Syrians, for example, who are actually considered refugees, right? So this isn't a map thinking about internal displacement, but when we look at where Syrians have gone to, right, they've gone to Turkey, They've gone to Jordan, to Lebanon, and in a little bit of some cases to Iraq, right? But so we really see the, the way that, that this is changing the landscape of countries in the Middle East as well. And so what are some consequences of this um, sort of in general, but in particular for, for countries like Turkey um, and, and Lebanon and Jordan? Right, so I think one of the main things is that particularly because refugees often remain within the same geographic region that they initially fled from, we see a really big burden of hosting refugees, right? And so if we think about the Middle East, especially, there's already a lot of instability in the Middle East, right? We talked about ethnic and national conceptualizations, right, war. And so this is a complicating stabilization of the region already, right? In a region that's already somewhat in, unstable. So in particular, I've, I've included a list here, right? We can think about how things like water, housing, food, jobs, education, healthcare are all going to come to be in, in short supply, not only for refugees, but also for people who are citizens and who are living in those countries already. And so I'd like to focus a little bit on, well, before I jump to that, um, right? We can also think about, there's a lot of outsourcing of these resources, to NGOs, right? So we'll see in, in Turkey or in Jordan or Lebanon, we see that oftentimes it's not the government of Turkey supplying these resources. For refugees, oftentimes it's NGOs, right? Um, that are sort of invited in to work with refugee populations to help manage um, these new groups as they come into the country. So I'd like to focus sort of on three main issues um, before providing some personal perspectives on 
some of these consequences at the personal level. So the first I'd like to talk a little bit about is housing. So housing is an issue already in many of these countries. Um, Kevin, if you can go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, and so I wanted to think a little bit about the Syrian um, refugee movement in particular to think about what different countries have, have done um, in response to the strain on housing. So in Lebanon, for example, they placed a number of restrictions on not having refugee camps. And I'll talk a little bit about sort of the label for, for refugees in Lebanon in just a minute. So as a result, uh, a lot of refugees, Syrian refugees were living in urban centers. Uh, and so this meant that they were often living in homes with poor quality, homes with overcrowding, homes with limited water and sanitation, and that they were subject to predatory land, landlords, right? So overpaying their rent um, or not having access to housing that they would otherwise have access to. In Turkey, um, people often live in camps um, or in large urban centers like Istanbul or Ankara. So I've included here a couple of different camps, right? And so you can see how massive the camps are um, in Turkey and also in Jordan. Um, and so a lot of them, especially early on, were, were you know, were made of tents. Um, they were tent cities. Um, once the, the displacement became more prolonged, um, containers were often used to sort of differentiate and provide a little bit more privacy for people um, who were living in the camps. And Jordan, we see sort of a similar um, mixture of, of housing. There's also a big reliance on refugee camps in Jordan, um, as well as a number of people living in Amman, which is the largest city in Jordan. Um, and Kevin, if you go ahead and show the next picture. Um, the next picture is of Zatari refugee camp, which is the largest camp in Jordan. Um, and it, at one point, um, was hosting so many people that it actually became Jordan's fourth largest city, right? So if we think about how, how refugee displacement is really impacting not only the landscape of, of these countries, but also just the, the sheer number of people that we see moving into the new, new places. Um, and what also happened as a result in both Turkey and Jordan is that because refugees were also moving to some of the major city centers, so that we saw a rise in, in rent prices as well, not only for refugees, but also for, for um, Turkish and Jordanian citizens, just because of a rise in demand. Um, and so you can think about how that, um, you know, sort of shapes non-refugees as well. Right, and this sort of relates to the next topic I'd like to talk about, which is societal implications, right? And so we can think about how in countries where there's already strained resources, how this is going to impact people. So some examples are thinking about the, the lived experiences of displaced persons, questions about access to education, access to employment, access to rights, well-being, and standards of living. Um, and we can also think right in the United States, we've seen this as well, how migration changes societal and political discourses. Um, that we might be having, right, sort of at the national level. Um, and another I'd like to talk a little bit more about is legal protections. And so one of the, the issues for refugees in particular is that these refugee situations are what the U United Nations terms as protracted, right? There's no real end to them. They've been going on for a long time, right? So we see this with Palestine, with Syria, and with Yemen, right, as Kevin shared earlier as well. When we think about internally displaced people, the average period of displacement is actually 17 years. And so, right, in some ways, the refugees who have crossed borders are, are able to get at least some temporary protection beyond their borders, whereas people who are in, internally displaced might not have any of those protections at all. Um, and again, right, thinking about statelessness that might result um, and how that can have legal implications for children in particular. And so here we can think about, for example, Palestinian refugees in Jordan have been Palestinian refugees in Jordan for you know, 30 to 50 to 70 years. Um, and so right as people marry and have children, 
that means that children might not have equal access to rights um, as other children, right? And that would include things like schooling and access to healthcare. Um, and people might also not have a right to work. And so this can be particularly um, detrimental for family well being. And oftentimes, what ends up happening is that people will then migrate to the Arab Gulf states, do some work, and come back to Jordan and then migrate again. Right. And so here we sort of see how displacement is then blurring those lines into economic migration that we talked about before as well, or in sometimes making it a requirement for personal livelihood. So to talk a little bit more about legal protections, I wanted to bring in some interesting work that I find really helpful for my own research on legal protections. And so there's a, there's a couple of books out recently. One um, is this table that I've shown you here, which gets back to, to some of our conversations earlier about the causes of displacement. And so we can think about how not only are the causes of displacement interconnected, but we can also think about how countries respond to displacement. And so the, the argument that Lamis Abdel Adi is sort of arguing is that to really understand how a country reacts to migration, we have to think about what the country's relationship is with the country of origin, and also to think about sort of how the, the country, the host country, feels about the refugee group that is migrating. So to make this a little bit more concrete, right, I'd like to talk a little bit about differences in how Syrians are labeled, right? So I started off at the beginning of our conversation today talking about how Syrians under the UNHCR are, are refugees, right? And that I was using that term in particular. But in Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey, Syrians are not considered refugees like they are by the UN. And so in these countries, you'll see there are different terms for how Syrians are talked about, right? So Jordan calls them guests. Lebanon calls them those fleeing unrest. And Turkey calls them our neighbors. And so this is important because there would be implications for Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey to officially recognize Syrians as refugees. They would be acknowledging the persecution from the regime onto its its own citizens. And so the countries don't make those decisions in terminology, right? They call Syrians something else. And so I think it's also, this is sort of a, you know, a next level thinking about how politics also play in, right? And foreign politics, diplomacy, all play in then to what protections people are given. But then we could also think about how that has implications for their lives as well. We can also think about this in sort of a broader international context. Um, so in the case of, of Germany, right, some refugees have been given refugee status and others have been given what's called subsidiary protection. So it's a less secure um, sort of legal protection. And so the result of that is that it, it takes people longer to get resident status. And it also does not allow them to have to apply for family reunification. Um, and so, right, if we think about this is rather complicated, but at each country level, there's going to be a different response to the people who are crossing the borders. And I've talked only just now about Syrians, right? If we think about Afghans, it's going to be another case. And so that has really big implications for how refugees and people who are displaced are treated um, both sort of at the societal level, but also in terms of what rights they're guaranteed. Um, it also Im has implications for thinking about refugee activism, right? So in some cases like Syrians and Jordan, we see that because of these legal protections and sort of the, the inequality that's in place, we see there's, you know, there's refugees working really and really promoting that they have equal provision of services that there's more representation of their interests um, and might even sort of use that to support war efforts, right? Or sort of come together um, towards activism as well. And so to sort of um, contextualize this a little bit more rather than talking about it abstractly, I wanted to share two family experiences from families who I did interviews with in the United States. 
um, but who right, went through the experience of living in Jordan and Turkey most often um, after leaving Syria. And so the first family I want to talk about is um, the family of Aliyah and Malik. So Aliyah left, they, they fled homes with their two sons who were three and two at the time in 2011. Um, and Malik had owned a used furniture store in Holmes, and they didn't move to a refugee camp. They settled in the capital city of Amman, but they faced years of discrimination and persecution there. And so Malik, for example, went to work, but he told me that he never received any wages for the work that he did in Jordan. Even though they had a shared language, right, speaking Arabic, and they had a shared religion, right, identifying as Muslim, with the Jordanian majority, Aliyah, the wife, tells me that we didn't feel like we belonged. Noah, the boy who was only three when they first moved there, uh, recalls having rocks thrown at him on his way to school and described the time in Jordan as, I quote, my worst years. I didn't like it at all. When I came here to the US, I feel really comfortable here. Right. And so here we see some of those consequences, right? We see the the strain over resources on employment, for example, um, and also direct discrimination. The second family that I wanted to share an example from is a Syrian family that moved to Istanbul. And so this, um, the, the woman, the wife, her name is Hanan, and the husband is Mohammed, and they fled Aleppo after the Syrian government used chemical attacks on the city. They and their five children went to live in Istanbul, and while they were there, the youngest, who was three, was diagnosed with leukemia, um, which his mother directly connected with the chemical attacks that had been used. So while they were in Turkey, uh, his mother, he and his mother spent most of their time in the hospital. And the father and the two oldest sons, who were 13 and 12 at the time, worked at a meat, meat packing plant. Even their nine-year-old brother was working at the meat, meat packing plant. The youngest daughter, Maram, went to Turkish school, but only for a few hours in the afternoon. She was not able to attend a full day of school because of a strain on right instructors and actual classroom space. Um, and then they came to the United States. Um, and one of the things that the kids in particular really missed was their grandparents. They had left behind their grandparents, their aunts and their uncles and cousins in, in Turkey, actually. Um, and they had qualified for resettlement because their brother had leukemia, right? And so they were resettled so that he could receive medical treatment. And so, right, it's, it's a complicated um, issue, right, to, to be resettled. And many of the consequences that you all identified and, and that we talked about can see how they, how they really intertwine at a personal level as well. And so I'd like to give you a, just a few, a minute again, right, to think about how you might dis discuss some of these consequences in the classroom, right? You can feel free to share in the chat if you want, um, but take, take just a minute to sort of process these consequences um, and how you might translate them, right, in a classroom context. Yeah, for those of you who have shared, I agree, this is something that's difficult, right, to, to talk about. Um, but at the same time, it's also an opportunity for building empathy with other students, or right, with, with refugees and those who are displaced. And that's also my hope in giving you some glimpses of, of stories as well, 
that might be helpful, right, for sort of thinking about this. And I find stories are always quite powerful, right, in, in helping us understand how others experience something. Yes, and we'll talk a little bit now in the next section as well about right, refugees and displaced people in the United States as well, right, and how some of these, um, these stories might become more, more concrete, right, with people that, that we know or people who are around us. Yeah, those are all really great ideas. So we're gonna jump into the sort of the, the final part of the talk, right? We've talked about the overview, we've talked about causes, consequences, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about these communities, right? People who, what happens to people afterwards in the longer term. And in this part of our talk, I'm gonna focus on two countries um, that are more often, you know, where we think about people being resettled or where we see asylum seekers going. And so my research is focused mostly on Germany and the United States. Um, and so I'll be talking about the, the experiences of Syrian refugees in those two contexts. And so I'd first like to share um, a little audio clip from an interview I conducted about the process of seeking asylum in Germany. And you'll see here, there are four pictures um, and these are all different pictures of places where Syrians and asylum seekers live in and around the city of Berlin in Germany. Um, and so you'll see, right, the first picture on uh, over at around 10 o'clock is a container tower. Um, the picture over around one or two o'clock is another container city sort of built right in the middle of a residential area. The picture down around five o'clock is actually an old school building um, that housed Syrian refugees as well. And the final picture at around seven o'clock is, is an interesting case. Um, so this is actually the field of the Tempelhof airport, which is where the Berlin airlift occurred. Um, and it used to be a small airport and is no longer in use. And so Berlin actually now uses the runways as a big park. And so you'll see here, can see some of the containers that have been sent up in, in the proximity to the old airport terminal. And behind it is the airport terminal itself. So when Syrians started coming um, in 2015 and sort of the first group of migration that was happening, people actually slept in the airport terminal. Um, and then afterwards they had built some, some container cities um, in the field, but right where I was taking this picture, uh, right, people are riding bicycles and roller skating. So it's a, a very sort of strange land use um, space as well. But I'll go ahead and let Kevin play this first clip, which is from Adnan, who is a 23 year old um, who sought asylum from D Damascus. And can you tell me a little bit about when you first arrived in Germany? What happened? What was it like? Mm. Uh, so we first arrived to a city on the borders, I think it's in Austria, not in Germany, it's called Passau, and this is where we were taken to take our fingerprints and take our uh, uh, basic information and put it into the German system, and then we were moved to Hanover, and from Hanover we were moved to Berlin, and from Berlin we were taken to the first uh, camp that you go to as a as an applier of as you apply for asylum in Germany. It's an Olympia Stadium. And from there we went uh, to the La Gezo, which is a social uh, organization that is also connected to the government. And they gave us uh, a place to stay in a, in a, also in a basketball stadium. We stayed there for around a month and a half. And then we moved to Altmarindorf, which is in the south of Berlin. And we stayed there for uh, six months. when you were living in the basketball stadium mm. and then in Altmaringdorf, yeah. uh, what were the conditions like? In the basketball stadium, of course, it was bad. We were, we were uh, sleeping with 300 people in the same hall, all together with different nationalities and different backgrounds. 
and we were also provided food as well, which was not that good, to be honest. And uh, yeah, it was not comfortable at all, of course. We were sleeping on not even mattresses. It's, uh, I don't know what they call it, but it's like the thing when you go like to emergencies and they hold you with it. Uh, okay, oh, they got caught. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So it wasn't that comfortable. In Alparindorf, I was I was living with uh, two guys and one of uh, one guy and a father and his son, mm-hmm. and we stayed there for six months. It was different because we had our own room, we had our own beds. It felt better. It felt uh, more uh, um, comfortable mm-hmm. to live there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And. So hopefully, right, hearing hearing the voice itself of right of someone, what it was like to seek asylum um, can also be a helpful sort of exercise to think about what the process is like. And when Ednan described at the beginning how they went from Passau to Hanover to Berlin to the what's called the Olympic Stadium, that all happened in one day. So the processing was very much uh, a very fast bureaucratic administrative system. Um, and In Germany in particular, in 2015, when Adnan was arriving, there were a lot of people arriving at one time, and the German state, the German government didn't have sort of a a system in place. And so people were often waiting for days outside of Legezo, which is the social service agency, um, for food, for money, for hotels to sleep in if they didn't have um, a camp to go to. Um, And so, right, sort of the disorganization was very much something that was a leading feature of this process of seeking asylum for a lot of the Syrians um, who went to Germany as well. So now I'd like to switch gears to think a little bit about the United States. What does refugee resettlement look like in the United States? Um, And so here I've shown first one graph that is a graph from an organization called the Migration Policy Institute, which is a great resource um, for all things migration related. But so this graph I wanted to show because sometimes you might hear conversation about the refugee cap, right? And so in the blue line, you'll see that there's, this outlines the refugee ceiling. So in the United States, the legal protections that refugees get are guided by the 1980 Refugee Act. And so under the 1980 Refugee Act, the United States set up a system for having refugees come to the United States, right? For what we think about today as refugee resettlement. And you'll see that there's a blue line um, and that every year the president can determine how many refugees can be brought in, right? And so this number is a ceiling, so it's not it's the maximum number of refugees that could be brought in. And so it's, it's not usually met. And so you'll see that the number of refugees who could enter is much lower or has been much lower now um, than it had been in the past. And you'll see even though, for example, since 2021, the refugee ceiling has been quite high, the actual number of refugees re- we have resettled in the United States has been very low. And so this is just to, I think this is important to contextualize in comparison to those numbers we saw earlier, right? If we're thinking about 120,000 refugees might come to the United States each year, but in reality in 2021, only around 20,000 came and there are 89 million people displaced around the globe, right? So sort of what, what the impact the United States is having is quite small. And the number of refugees here is also quite small. I've also created a graph um, that is showing some of the Middle Eastern countries that refugees are coming from. And so here you can see right in the last uh, five years, which perhaps isn't representative because of COVID, um, but you can see the number of the main places that people are coming from in the Middle East, right? So Syrians are among the top, as you might guess, Afghanistan as well. Um, Iraq, Iran, and Pakistan. And here I've shared this graph I've made from data with rapsnet.org data, which is the refugee processing center um, from the United States. 
And so there you can find all sorts of refugee data information that would also be a great resource if that's something that would be appropriate for your students. So the way that refugee resettlement works in the United States is that the, the, United, the US government subcontracts with refugee resettlement organizations. And these organizations receive government funds to help each person. Um, and so then the refugee resettlement organization are sort of the first key point of contact for refugees who are resettled in the United States. And they use the money subsidized or given from the government to help refugees pay their first three months of rent to buy food for the family. And in the first three months, kids start school, parents start learning English, um, and they sort of learn to sort through bureaucracy, right? How do you get food stamps? How do you get other assistance? How do you open a bank account? But after three months, the government funds for refugees are gone and families have to support themselves. And so what that means is, um, right, families, adults have to start working right away, oftentimes without learning English. And so there are some big consequences um, for refugees, given the way that the refugee resettlement system is set up. Um, right. One of them is that there's a big shift in class. And here I mean socioeconomic class. The cost of living in the United States is really high compared to most of the places people are coming from, especially for rent. That's the thing that people are most uh, surprised about is how much the rent costs in the United States. And oftentimes people who are being resettled weren't necessarily poor in their home country, right? They might have been pretty well off. And so oftentimes this transition to resettlement is also a lot of a confrontation with poverty, right? So what is it like to be poor in the United States and what is it like to be poor in general, right? So although the experience of displacement has been hard, the sort of the promise of resettlement isn't always matched the expectations of what people had or the, the lifestyles they had in their, in their home countries. Another change that often happens is one in gender roles. Um, so oftentimes women are not used to working in their home country, but have to work in the United States to earn enough money, right? Oftentimes the, the wages of one person are not enough to cover the rent. And so oftentimes women are also entering the workforce for the first time as well. Um, there's often also a change in work itself, right? So because um, refugees who are resettled don't always have English or often don't have English language skills and don't have the time to learn English in three months, they're often only able to work at menial jobs because they don't speak English. And so even if they had learned a skill of trade in their home country, this degree or certificate doesn't transfer. And so people who had been barbers in Syria are now working as dishwashers in the United States. And sort of a final challenge to refugee resettlement is the shift from urban versus rural lifestyles, and often sort of this confrontation with right, a suburban lifestyle. Um, and oftentimes people lived in more urban areas. And so the idea of driving everywhere, um, living where there's no real sense of community um, is often quite new. And so I wanted to share again a story um, from a refugee family in the United States. Um, and so this is the family of, or the, the story of Berfin and her husband Wilat, and they left the Syrian city of Afrin and went to Turkey um, with their two daughters and had another daughter after coming to the United States. And the father Wilat has had a disability since childhood that limits his ability to walk. And he had to have multiple surgeries since they came to the United States. Um, and even after having surgery, uh, severe pain continued to limit his ability to work. And his wife had recently begun working together with some other Syrian women um, at a nearby fast food restaurant to help cover the family's expenses. And so when I was speaking with Wilat in his interview, he talked a lot about how he doesn't feel safe in the United States. Um, he talked about how he had been robbed while riding his bicycle home from the nearby gas station one night and describes it as follows. He says, I don't feel comfortable here. I actually went to them at the refugee resettlement organization and I said to them, I want to go back. I don't want to stay here. And they said to me, it's not possible. We can't do that to send me back. 
I'm very tired here in America because of my leg. Disability support does not help me financially, and I don't know what to do. Right, so I think this, this family has had a particularly difficult transition, but we see some of these main themes, right? We see the, the shift in gender roles, changes in work, but also, right, sort of continuing, um, ongoing continuing issues, right? Whether they be health-related um, or, or mental health-related. So a lot, of, um, a lot of refugees also continue to struggle with PTSD, um, and there's not really time or resources to, to support them through that as, as it could be done. So this is the story of Willat that I, that I shared. And then I also wanted to share two examples of sort of the question of belonging at school, um, because right, again, in thinking about building empathy, I thought these might be stories that could be particularly useful. So I spoke with one 18 year old in Germany in 2019, who picked the pseudonym Hermione, right? So clearly a Harry Potter fan, um, but she talked about her her time in, in German schools. So she says, in the welcome class, you only learn German, pencil, flower, and then you learn to build sentences. And when you start at high school, then you need biology. Biology has such different terminology. History, there's thousands of terms. Math has even different terms. And we hadn't learned any of those. That was so painful for me because I was really good at school in Syria. I understood what they were talking about in Germany but I couldn't say anything. I couldn't participate, even though I was being evaluated in the same way. I didn't have any friends and the students bullied me. And Hermione talks a lot about how she really only felt like she found her place once she started going to an after-school program that was working with a lot of refugee and migrant kids um, and found there the resources that could really you know, take the time to get her the terminology she needed and help her to translate the knowledge that she had into, into German in a lot of ways. Another story um, is from Ahmed, who was 12. Um, and so he explains um, his first day of school. And so he says, when I came, I didn't speak English. So they asked on the first day of school, they asked us to say our name, our favorite, three of our favorite things, and how old are us? I said my name and how old I am, but the things I liked, I said just anything. I liked soccer, but I said swimming because I didn't know what soccer means in English, how to say it. I didn't know how to say soccer in English. And I asked, how does it make you feel that you get to grow up in, in America later in the interview? And he says, sad, because I haven't seen my country since only five years and a half. I was born there. I stayed there for five years and a half, and then we moved to Jordan. And I asked, do you hope someday you can go back? And he nods. Uh, and his mother also talked after our interview a lot about how this was really hard for Ahmed, that he was having a really difficult time, um, particularly in his transition to middle school, but that he was really eager to go back to Syria, right? Um, and to return to what he still considered his country, right? And so some of those ideas of, of culture and identity and how hard it can be to, to navigate those in a new place remain really critical for him. And finally, I wanna give a little bit of, of context for thinking about belonging and community. Um, and so some of this I've, I've talked about already. I wanted to share some pictures as well though. Uh, these are all from, from Germany, from Berlin. And you'll see here the mixture of English and German and Arabic. Um, on a street called Zonenale, which one of my interviewees in Berlin referred to as Arab Street. Um, and so it's the place where people go to buy Syrian bread um, and to have Arab food in the city. There are three main things I think that are sort of think important to think about what it means to belong in a new place or in community. The first is spatial layouts and infrastructure, right? I talked a little bit about this in a US context how it can be difficult to transition to a suburban sort of um, environment in the United States. In Berlin, um, interviewees said they had a stronger sense of place and of different neighborhoods in Berlin 
but that's in large part because of the availability of public transit and because that's something that the the Berlin city was was subsidizing so people would have access to public transportation to go to German classes. At the same time, though, people in Berlin also expressed expressed more experiences of racism and discrimination, often on public transit right so we see the benefit of of um, mobility within the city, but also how that meant that there were more interactions with Germans and a stronger. Um, more, more experiences of racism and discrimination. And also Berlin respondents were more explicit about sort of differentiating themselves from other migrant groups, right? They didn't wanna be seen as Afghans or as Iraqis, right? They wanted to prove to people around them that they were good refugees. There's also a difference in sort of resettlement and administrative processes. There are language barriers in the US, right? Both in terms of English, but also a lot of people experienced barriers from Spanish um, because they were working alongside Spanish speakers but didn't speak Spanish or English. In Germany, um, it's a requirement to learn German before beginning work. And so this was actually useful, right? Knowing German was useful. Knowing English was also useful in Berlin. Um, but people who were unable to learn German, like Hermione's father, then were not able to enter the labor force. And so they were then sort of doubly excluded from society, but also from labor market participation. And then we can think about how sort of national discourses about migrants and refugees continue to play a role in shaping how migrants themselves experience belonging. Um, and so we can see this, um, all the people I talked with had different ideas about what belonging meant. Um, and oftentimes they didn't like the refugee label. So people in the, in the United States talked about being resettled, right? Not being refugees. And people in Germany talked about being the new Germans was the way that one um, college student said a, an instructor referred to them as, um, or they would use the term geflüchtete, which means one who fled, right? So those are all different ways that sort of belonging comes together for people. So to sort of wrap up the, our conversation for tonight, I wanted to again give you the opportunity for reflection, but also provide you with some resources. Um, so the resources here are a list of some of the most common refugee resettlement organizations that work in you know, different areas across the United States. Many of them also work in North Carolina. I've also provided some data resources for global data, for international migration data, uh, for refugee data as well. Um, and some three of my favorite current books on the topic, um, right? One I've mentioned, the, the second book by Heba Gawaiid is a really interesting and well-written book about um, refugees in Germany, the United States and Canada, um, and offers a really interesting perspective about those three cases and how the states shape human potential. Um, and the final one is about um, sort of this question of forced migration and refugees, right? So it's really trying to complicate the, the refugee migrant binary. Um, and so those are all resources that I would recommend. Um, and I would encourage you to reach out to your local refugee resettlement organizations to also think about how you might get involved with your community. Okay, thanks so much, Michelle. This was really awesome. Those of you who are interested in those resources, I'll be emailing out the presentation to everybody. So you'll get a chance to click on all those links and um, see all of those uh, resources in greater detail if you want. I wanna ask you now, if you wanna to toss into the chat, what was your aha moment or the biggest takeaway from today's session? And what was something that surprised you or something that you're excited to share with your students or your colleagues or your community? So go ahead and type those in the chat. While y'all are typing aha moments into the chat, I wanna share a little bit more about how you can stay connected with the UNC Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies. Um, you can contact the director, Dr. Claudia Yehobi, at this email address, yehobi at email.unc.edu. Um, you can find more resources on their website, including um, curricular materials, lesson plans, um, videos, you know, connections to videos of previous seminars that they've held. That's all at mideast.unc.edu or you can catch them on Facebook or Twitter.
We also want to thank our partners once again at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And you can contact the um, Global Education Steering Committee at ncglobaleducation at dpi.nc.gov or see the Global Education website. They've got a short link here, bit.ly slash ncglobaled. One of the things you can find out about on that website is how to get your, in, your North Carolina Global Educator digital badge um, through completing assignments, through working with um, uh, the North Carolina Department of in Public Instruction to show your commitment to a global education. Let me finally preview the session for tomorrow, which is about people fleeing Myanmar and specifically how do they navigate health in times of conflict. Uh, you all may know that the coup in Myanmar in 2021 led to a fresh wave of um, refugees and asylum seekers coming out of that country. But Myanmar has actually been um, a major refugee generating nation for decades. And so we'll hear how that has played out both in the surrounding communities, um, right as folks flee Myanmar and communities here in North Carolina, how they're navigating their health. But finally, let me give you all the opportunity to get those continuing education hours for your participation today. You can go to go.unc.edu slash IEW hyphen Mideast. Answer a quick survey there to give us your personal data, the data about the school that you're teaching at and your email address so that we can email that um, uh, certificate to you come January from NCDPI. Once again, the link is go.unc.edu slash IEW Mideast. And I'll type that in the chat now. Thank you all for the great comments that we've got here about your aha moment, about some of the cool things that you've been learning through this time with Michelle Drumgold Sermon. If we were all in person, she would be hearing the thunderous applause for her fantastic presentation. Um, a lot of cool resources to keep us going moving forward. Um, that's the end of our seminar for tonight. Thank you all so much for joining. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out over email and I'll toss my email in the chat here now as well. We hope that we'll see you tomorrow night and again on Wednesday and Thursday for further sessions as part of our International Education Week professional development webinars on resilience in the face of conflict. For now, let me sign off and thank you all so much for participating.